ahead and introduce the session. Um, so this is the session that's defining precise translation and human relevance of, of current animal models. And uh, the committee um, really spent a lot of time thinking about this particular session, like where are some of the real different ways that people have really kind of deeply investigated um, how um, disease models are actually precisely mirroring um, human diseases. And so we hope that you'll enjoy this really diverse and amazing uh, group of people that we've assembled here today. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, David. Um, David is the director of the Institute of Genetic Medicine at Johns Hopkins, and he is the founding director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Inherited Disease Research. Uh, over many, many years, he has extensive experience in modeling diseases and has discovered uh, more than 20 genes and new diseases, and I just can't wait to hear your talk, so welcome very much. Thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers for uh, allowing me to participate in this meeting. Um, I, I will say at the outset that um, I missed the first talk, and I have a slight overlap of the first talk, so, but I think I'll be coming at it from a different perspective, so please bear with me. My background, as, as you heard, is in uh, medicine and human genetics. Uh, I've used model systems for a variety of experimental purposes, but I come at everything with a strong bias uh, of, of medicine, frankly. So uh, precision medicine, design, creation, use, and analysis of animal models. So I'll start off with uh, the definition of precision medicine, and apparently others have done this. Uh, precision, of course, uh, is usually defined as exact, accurate, or refinement in a measurement calculation or specification. Now, I don't think that the vast part, the vast swath of medicine is uh, accurate, it's at least it's not accurate to the sense that an engineer might call accuracy, might speak of accuracy. So the term precision medicine actually uh, is slightly grating to me, um, and perhaps I can just explain to you why. So uh, here I've contrasted precision and medicine or precision and biology. So if you think of precision, Think of some sort of very highly uh, uh, studied and designed uh, machine, in this case of an expensive watch, Swiss watch. Uh, whereas if you think of biology, you think of the idea that no two people look alike, no two people behave alike, and no two people uh, respond to environmental challenges in exactly the same way. And of course, the overall goal of the move towards what is called precision medicine is to individually uh, un understand each patient, or each individual, uh, in terms of their individual strengths and weaknesses. So if we contrast these two uh, areas, uh, both are complex. Uh, a watch or some, uh, something similar to a watch is made of very precise parts that are stamped out so that the part the corresponding part in one watch of the same type could be easily moved over to the next watch. Uh, the parts in biology, are, they're, all, they're recognizable, a liver is a liver, a heart is a heart, but there are individual differences if you look at those in any kind of detail. So in the, uh, in the machine, uh, the parts are interchangeable. In the biology, the parts are partially interchangeable. The machine is a closed system. These watches, for example, are hermetically sealed. They're dustproof, waterproof, every other kind of proof. Uh, humans and, and organisms in biology are open to the environment, so they're constantly being exposed um, in variable ways to the environmental variables. And the, our, our, each of our own individual biological systems is constantly sampling the environment and accruing a set of environmental experiences over the lifetime. Uh, the machine is designed by, as a perfect operation of perfection, and biology is uh, never perfect. It's imperfect, uh, and in fact, the imperfections are what make things interesting. Uh, the machine is designed by an engineer, let's say. Uh, the biological, the organism in biology is, of course, the result of evolutionary trial and error over two billion years. Uh, if the machine is broken, it's fixed by an engineer. If the individual is broken, it's uh, repaired by a physician. So 
uh, precision to me makes more sense to apply to something like a Swiss watch and a little bit less sense to apply to uh, something like a human organism. Um, and we can even look at the, uh, the um, sort of where did the ideas come from for designed uh, biology versus uh, uh, more ex uh, trial and error biology. So the uh, intelligent design came from William Paley. He was a great uh, biologist, but he had no theory to pin his, to explain his natural history. And in 1802, he suggested uh, intelligent design with this uh, famous uh, beginning of his book talking about crossing a heath and you, you, you stumble upon a watch and that watch must have had a maker who formed it for a purpose, who, who comprehended its construction, design, and use. Um, Evolution is quite different, and uh, a nice review of uh, ideas about evolution is by Jacob, uh, Francois Jacob in Science in 1977, and he, his article is called Evolutionary Tinkering. And he says, evolution works like a tinkerer without a plan, manages with odds and ends, leftovers, and rare new variants, and then natural selection determines what works and what does not, what is retained and what is not. So it's a completely different strategy for development of the uh, individual compared to uh, the machine on one hand design and uh, the individual in, uh, member of a species, re sort of the end point of evolution. Nevertheless, uh, when the idea of precision medicine got started, uh, back in, uh, the idea originally uh, was developed in 2009 and, and this uh, NRC uh, council uh, considered it. You've had a slide with the members of the NRC council. Um, and this council, uh, and, and they issued their report towards precision medicine in 2011 and President Obama, um, I think, studied that report or somebody in his team studied that report and he uh, immediately uh, thought it was a great idea and a way to um, stimulate uh, biomedical research, support for biomedical research. And I, I won't realize his quote, I won't read his quote down below, but it basically says that each patient is, an, is a, uni a unique individual. And the more you are in medicine, the more experience you have, the more you will be able to discern just by experience the uniqueness of each patient. What we're talking about here is a new initiative to identify many of the unique features beforehand and to allow uh, the physician and the patient uh, to uh, appreciate their own strengths and weaknesses uh, and to tailor their lifestyle and their management of their health problems uh, accordingly. So um, when President Obama announced that initiative, of course there was this paper that, followed, that came along immediately after by Francis Collins and Her Harold Varmus explaining uh, in somewhat more detail what the, what the plan uh, was going to look like or what it looked like. And basically, it comes down to prevention and treatment strategies that take individual variability into account. I actually prefer individualized medicine because I think it's closer to the definition, but I don't think I'm going to change it now. But I'm, I throw it out there just so you're aware of it. And if you're interested in this, there's a paper by Maynard Olson that came out just in the last uh, couple of months talking about this, the history of this uh, toward precision medicine. Uh, according to Maynard, who is uh, terrific, um, the idea got hatched at an Illumina meeting, uh, and the principals were David Walt, a, a PhD um, chemical engineer at Harvard, Alan Williamson, who PhD was in chemistry, but was in a sort of um, uh, the genomics industries, and then Maynard himself, also a PhD in chemistry. So it's interesting that the hatching of the idea for precision medicine came from three PhDs, all with a degree in chemistry. Um, um, the, the whole effort was influenced by the, the Human Genome Project, which had gone before, and as Maynard said, the idea was it's time to deliver on the original promise of the Human Genome Project. And one of the strong emphasis in the initial thinking about precision medicine was this idea of a new taxonomy of disease. After all, the one we currently use was developed many centuries ago, and we have lots more data now, and we could rethink how we uh, uh, ca uh, uh, ca characterize disease and, and uh, in ways that might be more um, 
uh, productive in terms of how we manage patients and prevent disease. Uh, like the Human Genome Project and this, uh, the precision medicine movement, there was a lot of emphasis on data sharing. There was emphasis on rich longitudinal phenotyping. That came up in one of the questions. Uh, the idea of continuously updating the data, the data that we had and indexing all of this to an individual patient as, as the physician uh, and the patient uh, went through the lifetime of the patient. Uh, and this model is in, in the original report, this idea of on the left a new taxonomy of disease that would enable more accurate diagnosis, more targeted treatment, and improved health outcomes. Uh, the major challenge, and the planners realized this, was integration into medical thinking and practice, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but speaking for myself and all of my colleagues in medicine, it's really hard to change medicine. Uh, and uh, what also came out of this was the idea of collecting in a precise way data uh, and integrating those data in ways that it could be analyzed and used going forward. So in my view, that precision applies nicely to the kinds of data collected and the way the data are analyzed, but it, it is not a good fit, in my view, for the biology, the underlying biology. So <clears throat> what does this all mean uh, for uh, medicine? This is a famous picture by Eugene Smith of a doctor practicing in Kansas in the late 1940s, rest assured that there are very few doctors that practice this way now. So although medicine abhors change, uh, it does change. Now, um, <clears throat> some relevant principles. Uh, from my point of view, uh, all disease has both a genetic and an environmental component. We often speak, and I do it all the time, of this patient has a genetic disease. Really. Everybody has a genetic component to their disease. In some cases, it's more obvious. Those would be the Mendelian disorders. In other cases, it's more subtle, but it's there. And uh, those are the complex traits, which after all tend to cluster in families uh, and in individuals who share particular uh, variants of particular genes. And all disease has an environmental component. Your genotype is interacting with your environment from the time of conception forward. And of course, epigenom epigenetics is sort of the main area where that interaction uh, takes place. But it goes on over the lifetime of the individual. Uh, second point is heterogeneity of etiology in response. Um, and this comes back to what the experienced physicians have learned. Although we may give two individuals the same diagnosis, we know in our heart of hearts that the reasons they have those diagnoses and how they're going to respond to our attempts to manage that diagnosis is going to be variable and will be ultimately specific for that individual. Everyone has their own disease uh, as we learn more about this. Uh, the third principle is we have to consider disease across the lifetime of the individual. If we uh, recognize someone at risk for disease and, and uh, forestall their, their, uh, the onset of the phenotype, we may move it farther back in the lifetime, much to the benefit of the patient, uh, or it may be that we treat the disease that we know only to find out when individuals are treated for the problems we know, they develop new problems as they get older and accrue more environmental experiences. Uh, the fourth point I've already mentioned, change is difficult, even for the better. And we can do better. Medicine can do better than we are currently doing. We, we do great right now, but we could do be much better. So there's every reason to pursue uh, this line of thinking. Now, I should mention uh, the what are, have been called the Security Council of Model Organisms. Most of what I have to say hereafter will be mouse. But I always say that you, to investigators, you should use the model most appropriate for your question. And depending on your question, yeast may be the very best model system. In other circumstances, you need a furry, warm mammal such as a mouse. So you l use the model most appropriate for your question. Jerry Fink has called this the Security Council of the Model Organisms. Uh, now, I, it, what, in what follows, I'll just talk about three main ways that mouse models and other kinds of, I'll talk a little bit about zebrafish, uh, can be used to further the purposes of individualized medicine. One large area uh, is to confirm causation. We're in an age where we're using whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing to find variants in particular genes that contribute to phenotype. 
uh, invariably when that analysis is done, we don't have one single variant, but we have a short list of variants, and we need to uh, go away from the simple bio bioinformatics work and confirm it with a real, experience and very a real experiment, and very often that involves some mouse work. Uh, a second big area is that mouse models are, are a very good uh, experimental system for understanding disease pathophysiology. We're actually best at understanding the genetic variation that leads to disease and understanding the phenotype that results, but how you get from the gene to the phenotype remains a big challenge. So this is a very important contribution uh, for uh, model organisms. And then uh, mouse models and other model systems can be used as surrogates for treatment studies that are very difficult or very time consuming uh, to test initially at least in humans. So uh, let me give you some examples. So first I want to mention a, an area that we've been working in at, at Hopkins. Uh, we're one of the centers for Mendelian genomics. There are four centers in the country that are funded to find individuals with presumably unexplained Mendelian phenotypes, use whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing analysis and other kinds of studies to try to identify the causative variants and the causative genes. Uh, and this has been, we're in, the, these four centers are in, uh, we're in our the end of our fifth year right now. Uh, the current scorecard is uh, kept track of, you can find in OMIM, Online Mendelian Inheritance of Man. There are about 8,500 Mendelian phenotypes uh, described in the literature. Uh, there are 3,812, at least as of 28 September, uh, genes in which variation can cause a recognizable phenotype. That's only 18% of the total, so we have a long way to go. Uh, and that explains about 6,000 phenotypes, so you can quickly see that some genes account for more than one phenotype. And it leaves us with, in OMIM, 2005, about 2,500 unexplained phenotypes. And it's important to realize that currently about 300 new phenotypes come into OMIM every year. So it's not, we've not saturated this yet. Now, what have the CMGs done over five years? Uh, in aggregate, uh, these centers, uh, Yale, uh, UW, and Baylor Hopkins were a team, and, and more recently Broad. Uh, in the combined effort, we've identified about a thousand novel disease genes. These are high uh, quality candidates in some instances, in other instances they're absolutely confirmed. Uh, we've also identified about a thousand disease, known disease genes. How did we do that? We looked at a patient or a small number of patients with a phenotype that we didn't recognize, so we accepted it as an unknown. When we did the analysis, we found mutations, variants in a known disease gene, and very often that allowed us to expand the phenotypic uh, spectrum of a particular disorder. So we call it a phenotypic expansion, or PE. And we've released a lot of data to dbGaP and ClinVar that's in the spirit of the precision medicine, and we've developed a lot of public resources that are listed there. And the plot down below shows that the pace continues over time. Uh, and the big problem here related to this, uh, today's discussion is that very often we have a very high quality, quality candidate gene, let's say it segregates appropriately in a small family, it makes some biological sense, but in the end you have to close the circle and do some kind of functional studies, uh, let's say in a mouse, to show that you've got the right thing. So it's very important. Uh, and sometimes you can do it in other model organisms. I show these data. This is a colleague of mine, Courtney Woods, Andy McCallion, and Hal Dietz. And uh, they've been looking at the genes responsible for uh, a bicuspid aortic valve that occurs about 1 to 2 percent in the general population, very heterogeneous genetically. And they've been doing it in a zebrafish model. And they've learned how to phenotype these zebrafish in terms of doing an EKG and an echocardiogram on a zebrafish. And, so this gene, Robo4, was a high-quality candidate, and when it was targeted in the zebrafish, it caused abnormalities of the development of the aortic uh, root and valve. So that gives strong evidence that we, we were up barking up the right tree. So improving uh, phenotyping. Now, one thing I want to say about causation is the importance in medical genetics of allelic heterogeneity. So the sort of first blush in the mouse is to knock the gene out, but we'll miss a lot of biology. Uh, so just consider these two examples. The boy on the left has Marfan syndrome, very tall stature, long limbs, hyperextensible joints, and that is caused by uh, 
F fibrillin 1, FBN1, loss of function music mutations that are dominant, so he's heterozygous to that mutation. The woman on the right has short stature. She has progressive fibrosis. She has joint contractures rather than hyperextensible joints. And she has a, 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 a missense mutation, a very specific missense mutation in the exact same gene. So unless we model these allelic variants, we're going to miss a lot of interesting biology and we're going to miss causation. And another way to see that is if you take all the phenotypes in OMEM, this is, this is a, they, these data are a little old, but it really hasn't changed, so there were 2,700 or so disease genes, and you ask for each disease gene how many phenotypes are attached to it. And you can see on the left that most have one phenotype, but note that the curve goes way off to the right, and there are some genes that have 13 or 14 discrete phenotypes. These were phenotypes that medical geneticists thought were different entities, likely different disease genes, and they turn out to be different mutations in the same gene. So that says we have to, uh, a knockout mouse is maybe the first step, but ultimately we have to put the alleles in, uh, very specific alleles using CRISPR-Cas9 to, to show causation and to understand pathophysiology. Now, understanding pathophysiology, I'm only going to give one ex example. I already said it's a very tough uh, problem and takes time. This is the work of my colleague Hal Dietz and, 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 uh, and his team on Marfan syndrome. Uh, and I already said they, in 1991, they showed that the gene responsible was fibrillin 1. We now know that Marfan syndrome mutations are loss of function, and they disrupt this complex of um, uh, the extracellular mat matrix, and, and um, turns out that the fibrillin contributes to these fibers in the extracellular matrix, and that binds uh, a, um, a GTP bi or uh, TGF beta binding uh, protein. In the absence of that uh, function, then you essentially have elevated levels of free TGF beta, and you're essentially in a TGF beta storm, and that works through a signaling pathway involving SMAD2, 3, and SMAD4, and activates or, or, or changes the transcription of certain genes. So that's a lot of work. That's about two decades of work to get to this uh, point of knowledge and, is and explains the aortic aneurysm, the emphysema, the mitral valve prolapse, and the myopathy characteristic of uh, Marfan syndrome and points towards TGF-beta antagonists as the appropriate, appropriate therapy. Now surrogates for treatment studies, I'll just say a word about, I'll exemplify it by one disease and I'm almost done here, um, a particular disease that we studied for many years in my lab called gyroid atrophy of the choroid and retina, it's a rare retinal degeneration. It's an autosomal recessive trait. It's, uh, biochemically, there's ornithine accumulation to levels about 10 to 15 times normal, and that it's a due to a deficiency of an enzyme ornithine aminotransferase, and the relevant biochemistry is shown below. The gene is called the OAT gene. And the patients present with myopia in the first decade, and then they develop a very characteristic chorioretinal degeneration. The course of the disease is several decades. So here shows the fundoscopic views, and you see a young patient on the left, a teenager in the middle, and an older person on the right. Most of the retina is gone on the person on the right. There's just a tiny sliver. So we wanted to treat them with their arginine-restricted diet, which we thought would lower the ornithine, and we guessed might improve their outcome. But the patients come in at different ages. They're able to come. It's very rare. They come in at different ages. They follow the diet with different levels of compliance, and they have extreme allelic heterogeneity. It's very hard to do a meaningful clinical study over, let's say, 10 or 15 years with all of this variation. Now, of course, if you put it into a mouse, the mouse, you got them under control. They all eat the same diet. You can put them on the diet whenever you want, and you can follow them along. Now, interestingly, the mouse retina actually has some differences from the human retina. There's no macula and some other things, but they do get a retinal degeneration that starts at two to three months. If you put them on an arginine-restricted diet, keep their ornithine level no, lo, low, uh, at one year, and this is a cross-section of the retina, it's perfectly normal. By contrast, the mice on a, a, a standard diet will have a high ornithine, and their retina is completely degenerated. So there, in one year, time, in my mind at least, we convincingly showed that lowering the ornithine is therapeutically beneficial, and that was after we worked in humans for 10 to 15 years and still had variable uh, un uncertain results. So very powerful, very powerful. 
So I, I will stop there. Um, uh, I think this conference is very exciting and to uh, understand and explore the ways that we can bring the model organism community together with um, people in the front lines of uh, precision medicine to the benefit of both groups. Thank you very much.